right, welcome to Bad Music Taste and Other Ways to Ruin Your Life. My name is Dominic. And my name is Sam. Dominic has a record this week. This week's record is Back with a Bong by Murphy's Law. This record was first released in 1989, and the copy I have here is a first pressing on clear vinyl. Anyways, today we're talking to Porcel from Youth of Today and Judge. How's it going? My public service announcement is, kids out there, don't use a bong. Bongs are bad. <laughs> Bongs are bad. Go straight edge. <laughs> Drugs will ruin your life. Stay away from Molly or whatever the freaking opiates you guys take these days. Fentanyl. What are the drugs that people do in school these days? Vape. Um, <laughs> yeah. Vape. 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 And like, there's like an occasional kid who brought weed to school. I no, mean, I don't get it. Like when you say when you say vape, like what do they put in the vape? They put pot in there. It's basically like nicotine and just worse. Like just yeah, it's people. like it's like cigarettes, <laughs> but people think that they're better because they're electronic, so they'll like abuse it. But they're really not. Yeah. Man, oh man, it's becoming more complicated to be a kid these days. Yeah. I'm totally. By the way, I'm totally fascinated by you guys. Who are you? How old are you? What's your deal? Are you guys punk rockers? How did you? I want to interview you guys. I'm fascinated. <laughs> I have um, teenagers too. I'm a dad. So it's like, you guys remind me of my kids. <laughs> well, um, Dom, you can introduce yourself first, I guess. <laughs> um, I mean, we're, we're both in, in Baltimore. Uh, we've been, yeah, I, I don't know. I've been listening to punk rock since like I was in the womb. <laughs> your, your, your parents are punk rockers. Yeah. So oh my I, god, you're so lucky. So I picked it up like from from the car. <laughs> my dad hated punk rock. He hated it. Oh my god. You ever heard that you ever heard that um misfit song that goes, I ain't no goddamn son of a bitch. Yeah. You better think about it. One time I was like bl- in my room and I'm just like blasting the misfits, blasting that song. And my dad kicks in the door. <laughs> what the hell are you listening? This song is outrageous. This song is filth. How can you listen to this stuff? This is awful. I'm like, no, dad, it's great. <laughs> I ain't no goddamn son of a bitch. Don't you get it? <laughs> he didn't. He didn't get it. Not at all. I'm the cool punk rock dad, but my kids are into like indie rock and like Billy Eilish and uh, Lana Del Rey, my daughter likes. <laughs> Some of the stuff she actually plays is pretty cool. You ever heard of a band called Soccer Mommy? No. You ever heard of a band called Snail Mail? They're, they're kind of like the cool indie rock teenager. Yeah. It bands of the day, but they're actually super cool. They remind me of like, you know, Husker Du or some of the like, you know, college rock type stuff that I used to listen to when I was a kid. They're actually really good. I, I, I got to admit, I kind of like that stuff. Yeah, I'm kind of, like, all over the place. Um, Like, I'll listen to, like, some punk music because, like, Dominic's, like, introduced me to that kind of music. Um, And obviously, we talk to, like, a lot of hardcore and punk rock musicians. So, like, I just know, like, the knowledge of who these bands are. But, like, I can't say I listen to all of them because, like, you brought up, like, indie. Like, I listen to some of that stuff, too. So, yeah. Okay, what what are some of your favorite bands or singers? Uh, Have you ever heard of Wallows? no okay so i like wallows the regrets i like machine gun kelly um machine gun kelly machine gun kelly the rap guy yeah (laughs) yeah my my kids like a bunch of like rappy kind of stuff do you guys like lil peep (gasps) i love my (laughs) my son was like obsessed with lil peep and then you want to know what he did he sat me down and he and he forced me to watch that documentary Oh, I and I found, I found Little Peep to be completely fascinating. What a story that guy had. Yeah, I cried a lot, honestly. <laughs> Dominic, Dominic, do you like Little Peep or you're not into him? Uh, no, no. He doesn't, no. <laughs> you, know, it's, it's a, it's a, you, know, you know what's so great about Little Peep? Little Peep kind of like embodied that punk rock ethic of DIY. Do it yourself. Yeah. He didn't have, like, a, he didn't have a record label. He didn't have a recording studio. He didn't have any money. He would just set up Garage Band on his on, but he was just driven to do music. So he would set up Garage Band on his computer. He had his mic. 
And he would just kind of like, he was super creative and he would just make these songs and put them out on SoundCloud, promoted everything himself. And it was really cool because, you know, those early shows that like his footage of like, like his first tour that he did and they would play like, you know, like uh, BFW halls and like, you know, stuff like that. Like they wouldn't even play real clubs. And like just by word of mouth, kids would come and they would get maybe 75 kids would come to the show but all those kids knew his music from SoundCloud. So he would play without a stage with like 75 kids that really liked him. And it was an awesome like little show. It reminded me of like those early Youth of Today shows where we would go out and we would play these punk clubs. And, you know, there was like a burgeoning straight edge scene. So, we, you know, in every city there would be, you know, 50 to 100 to 200 straight edge kids. And they would come see Youth Today and it would be a really small show in a pizza place or something like that. But the show would just be off the hook because the people really loved the band. So, and it was really cool how he just kind of built himself up from nothing. And I tell you, if he, drugs are bad, people. Kids, <laughs> if you're listening, drugs will F up your life just like they F'd up Little Peep's life. You know, if he, you know, that, that, that documentary, it makes it so obvious that if he didn't die of an overdose, he probably would have been a huge star. He honestly and, just like changed what the music industry was. I mean, did. like he did everything himself and like there's so many um, like rap especially, but there's so many artists that are now just kind of doing the same thing because they saw that it's possible. Like when you grow up and you're thinking like, well, I want to be a musician. You're like, OK, well, where do I start? So when you kind of start in like a smaller scene like that, where it's just you who's running it. Yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> it's you know it like his story is so empowering for the musician because you know the old model is i have to be in a band i have to put out a, a good demo i have to like you know take it around to all these record labels and beg for a record deal hopefully i get a record deal and then if the record label puts enough money and attention into me like maybe i can make it as a musician yeah. but he was just like, okay, nobody's going to do this for me, so I'm going to do it myself. And here's a guy right. without a record label, goes and tours Russia, and he shows up to Russia. No record label, no record label behind him. Shows up to Russia, and he's got like thousands of kids waiting for him in the airport, and he plays his first show, and it's still like 3,000 people. You know, it, it, it totally rewrites um, – what it, the the possibilities of what a musician can do in this world it's so empowering especially for kids yeah. you can do music you can put it on the internet you don't need to, you don't need to beg some record label for some record deal it's almost like these record labels are just becoming obsolete these days you promote it yourself you work really hard you tour relentlessly and you know you can actually make it from that especially yeah. in these days with, like with the internet with social media where you can market things yourself and I found it like a really super inspiring story. He was really creative. He probably, and even his music was really creative. Like, you yeah. know, for an old guy like me, I can't really wrap my head around it, but I, but I understand that he's taking all these different elements, you know, from everything from like, you know, hip hop to trap music to, you know, you know, Blink 182 and some 41. He's kind of melding it all together and he's coming up with something new and sort of groundbreaking. And I tell you, I watched that, I, I saw that and I had a lot of respect for him and it, and it sucked. It sucked that, you know, this drug culture amongst young people is so prevalent. And I tell you, the drugs are way more dangerous now when you start to get into opioids and things like that. And he's just a perfect example of just, you know, drugs fucking suck. I don't want to yeah. swear in front of you guys. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> oh, no you're fine. We, it's, don't it's swear. Cool. Don't swear. Come on. You guys are just too young and cute to swear. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it, he's the perfect example that, you know, drugs, they will, they will kill your creativity. They'll even kill your, they'll even kill you. So, you know, you know, I've been straight edge my whole life, you know, I, and I wasn't always straight edge. How old are you guys? Uh, 13. Okay. When you guys, you know, when, when I was 13, I had an older brother that was three years older than me. He was like 16. You know, so, and, and when I was 14, he was like 17. So he was a big party guy in school. He was like on the football team. He was like Mr. Party. I'm sure you guys have that kind of kid in yeah. your school. 
And so he thought it would be really cool to drag his little brother to all these parties. And so when I was like your age, I was going to these like high school parties, like keg parties, and I was getting hammered, like uh, hammered. Like, and you know, when you're like 13, it doesn't take much to get you to get messed up. You know, like I would drink three or four beers and I could barely even walk. And so people thought it was really cute. Here's this cute little 13 year old kid who can barely walk. And so I started going to parties with my brother when I was like 13, like literally every weekend, it became a thing. Like every Friday, every Saturday, I was going to parties and getting drunk when I was like super young. And you can imagine what that does to your brain. Like your brain is still growing, your body's still growing and you're poisoning your body on a regular basis. It's so unhealthy. And you know, there was such a peer pressure in my school that if you wanted to be cool, like my brother, you know, you part of that being cool is you had to drink, you had to party, you had to do all sorts of drugs, you know, and then later on it escalated into like Coke, you know, and things like that. And um, it was probably around like 15, you know, I had spent like two years of partying pretty hard and becoming like a party kid in my school when I was just like, you know what, this just isn't for me. Like I'm waking up, you know, and when you're like 14, 15 and you're going to a party, you're getting super drunk. You know, I probably weighed like 80 pounds. Like, you know, it's just like, you know, it, I'm super hungover. Like sometimes I'd be hungover for like two or three days. And finally, like I was just getting the picture like this isn't for me. Like, I don't want to live like this. Like, I don't want to have to be peer pressured into going to a party and feeling like I got a shotgun, a bunch of beers and you know, and then as I was getting older and, you know, my brother was like a senior and stuff, like then they're starting to do like more serious drugs, you know, pills and things like that. And I was just like, I don't want to do that. Like, that's kind of scary to me. I don't know if I'm going to like wake up alive, you know, the next morning. And so finally, when I was like 16, I was just like, I'm just, you know, I made this decision that I'm going to go straight edge, you know, minor threat, like your hat was one of my favorite bands. You know, they had that song Straight Edge. And it's just like, there's other people that feel the same. You know, Minor Threat gave me the courage that, you know, they had that song Straight Edge was the anti-drinking, anti-drug song. And it gave me the sense that I'm not the only one that feels like this. There's other people in this world that just are sick of doing drugs, sick of drinking, sick of like being peer pressured into it, sick of the whole party culture which is all just a bunch of like insecure kids who just think that they have to do self-destructive things in order to impress their friends that's all it is if you threw a bunch of a bunch of 15 year old kids in a house without any drugs or any booze they would have just as much fun because a bunch of kids just getting together they're just going to have fun and enjoy each other's company even minus the drugs and the alcohol and it didn't make any sense to me that, um, you know, that had to be part of the equation. And so I made one of the most important decisions I ever made in my whole entire life when I was 16. I was just like, I'm not going to do this anymore. And all my friends, you know, I was on the football team. I was one of these quote unquote cool guys in school. And I just told all my friends, I was just like, I'm not going to party anymore. That's like, that's it. I'm straight edge now. I, I put X's on my hands and go to school. And, um, there was a huge backlash. All my friends were like, what are you? A, you're not going to party? You're not going to the keg party? What are you, a loser? You're going to go to a hardcore show instead of going to the keg party? What kind of loser are you? And I was just, and, and then I was just like, that's it. Like, I don't want part of any kind of social club where I'm considered a loser because I won't pour alcohol down my throat till I throw up. <laughs> you know? And so I made like new friends. I became, you know, I became a punk rocker. I started going to shows. I started making friends with straight edge kids. And to this day, I don't drink. I don't do drugs. And I tell you, it's, um, it's one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. You want to know another incredible major decision that I made in my life that was like groundbreaking that changed the whole trajectory of my life. For sure. You guys ready? You guys yeah, ready sure. for this one? You guys ready for this one? When I was 19, I decided I was going to go vegetarian and I decided it was pretty effed up that here we have a system that brutalizes and cruelly 
um, kills animals by the millions and billions just so I can have some hamburger on my plate when it's actually way healthier to eat plant-based. So why am I going to subscribe to a system of cruelty just so I can have a hamburger on my plate and just so I can eat like Kentucky Fried Chicken? And in my punk rock mind, I said, if I don't agree with something, I'm not going to take part in it. And so I stopped eating meat. And let me tell you, dude, I'm, I'm 53 years old. I will do more push-ups than the, than the freaking t- most fit guy. You take the most fit guy in your school, and I will still do more push-ups and more sit-ups than that guy. It's just like when you don't do drugs and when you eat healthy and when you eat plant-based, you know, that health just kind of sticks with you. It was two of the most important decisions I ever made in my life. So if you guys have like a young audience, get punk rock, man. Don't freaking subscribe to a bunch of BS freaking social peer pressure to do self-destructive things. Just don't do it. Just like have enough like self-respect and, and, and just um, independent thinking that even if I have to like be the only one in my school to do this, I know this is right. And I know what my path is and I'm just going to follow it. And it's important just to kind of develop that, that, and, and punk rock gave me that. And it was, it was one of the most kind of valuable, like life lessons that I picked up from punk rock. If you don't, if you don't agree with something, don't do it. Forge your own path, figure out what's right in your own heart and follow that. You know, even like when my, even when my, you know, and, and you know, even when my dad, you know, my dad was, you know, just seeing you guys, it brings up all this stuff of when I was a teenager. You know, I was really into hardcore and I was in this band called Youth of Today. And my dad wanted me to go to college because I was really smart in school. I got straight A's. You know, I probably, you know, um, I, I probably could have got, you know, scholarships, schools and things like that. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be a musician. I was I was into writing songs and touring and meeting people and traveling all around the world. And so I wanted to take my shot at doing that. And my dad was furious at me you have to go to college you'll never make a living you have to go to college you have to graduate you have to get some nine to five job that's the only way that you're going to be able to do it you're you're ruining your life you're throwing your life away and all this punk rock bs and you know punk it gave me that kind of like confidence that i could just be like hey dad this is my life this isn't your life I don't want to be a businessman like you. As a matter of fact, I can see even though you have a lot of money and you have a big house and you live in the suburbs and you have a really nice car, it's not even making you happy. Don't try to fool me. I'm your son. I see you every day. You're not happy. You're like a grumpy son of a bitch. So why do I want to do what you did that made you like super unhappy? Like he's going to a job that he doesn't want to go to every single day for decades on end. I don't want to do that. I want to follow my heart, my creativity and try to make a living off of something that I love, you know, and even to, even to this day, I don't really, you know, I'm not a full-time musician anymore, but I'm a yoga teacher. It's something that I love to do. It's something that, you know, inspires me and it keeps other people healthy. And I feel like it's a service that I do for other people that keeps, you know, people peaceful and on the right track and, and mentally and physically healthy. And I'm really happy for that. I'm really happy that I learned those punk rock lessons when I was like your age. And it really made a huge difference in my life. If that has helped you, hopefully in the future, that will help you guys because it really helped me. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, we're, we're straight edge by, by age. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we don't really even have a choice right now, so. <laughs> well, well, I tell you, that's good because, you know, the, 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 the non-straight-edge ante has been upped. And now you have these, like, you know, you know what's really scary is because you could even just smoke pot these days and they lace that pot with everything addictive that they can think of. And a lot of times they'll take, you know, the scary thing is like fentanyl is like one of the most, that's what, that's what little people eat on. I believe fentanyl It's one of the most addictive things on the planet. It's like an opioid that's made in the lab. And um, so 
pot dealers will just sprinkle fentanyl on pot because they know kids will be addicted to it and and then they'll always come back it's like a you know it's it's smart business if you have no freaking ethics and you just want to destroy your destroy a bunch of little kids it's actually horrible but pot dealers will do it you know if you think oh i'm just gonna buy some uh xanax they'll put fentanyl in xanax they'll load it with any kind of addictive things that you can think of and before you know it man you can get really screwed up so um, i'm hoping that you guys will get inspired by uh youth of today and straight edge and all these kind of like newer straight edge bands and um yeah get into it think for yourself man don't let other oh, people think for you yeah we've we've gotten a couple uh, a couple straight edge people on before we're trying to get ian mckay on <laughs> yeah i bet you i bet you ian mckay would do it and you know what's really cool music is so powerful you know it was bands like minor threat and, you know, bands like Seven Seconds, uh, you know, bands that had these kind of like straight edge anthems that really, they changed my life. They changed my life. And when I did bands like Youth Today, I was in a band called Judge. I was also in another band called Shelter. And my whole idea of doing a band was to put out a positive message and try to give back what was given to me like you know those bands had such a huge impact on my life positive impact on my life that i wanted to do that i wanted to be in a band that some kid could listen to and be like wow you they super inspired me and i tell you it worked too you know tons of kids come up to me hey i heard that you today song no more it really made me think i became vegetarian from it and it's a good feeling you know it's a good feeling to know that you've kind of paid it forward a little bit for all these bands that really inspired and influenced me. Are, are you guys in bands? You guys do music? Uh, I was, <laughs> I, I played with a couple of my friends for a little bit, but then uh, like the pandemic kind of. <laughs> yeah, the pandemic ruined it for all of us. Yeah, I mean, we all play, we both play instruments, but like I'm not in a band, so. What do you, what do you guys play? I play the violin, so. Uh, I play. Wow, awesome. I play the bass, the guitar, and the drums. Wow, you're a you could put out your own solo record. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, drummers. Uh, let me tell you, it's great to learn drums because drummers are few and far between. And if you become a good drummer, you'll have millions of bands trying to get you in the band because it's so hard to find a drummer. I think it's just because drums are so loud. Like parents don't want their kids to play drums. Oh, my, my dad plays the drums, so. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. And he, Your dad's awesome. You have a punk rock dad who plays drums? <laughs> he, so I've been playing, like, since I was born. And um, from there, I just, like, got into it and then just got better over time. <laughs> I'm, I'm, in, I'm intrigued with your dad. Tell me about your dad. What's his deal? Uh well he's he's from uh Rochester. Uh wow. Rochester, New York. Yeah, I know where Rochester is. That's cool. Yeah, and he uh Did you grow up listening to like Minor Threat and the Dead Kennedys? Like what kind of music did he listen to? Um The Descendants are my favorite band. The Descendants are his favorite band. I love <laughs> The Descendants. I've got I so I you, <laughs> check this out. I freaking saw the Descendants when I was your age. That's how long the Descendants Whoa. have been playing. <laughs> I saw I saw the Descendants literally like when I was like 15 years old. The Descendants came out with that first record, that Milo Goes to College record, and I saw them on that tour. I was so excited. They were. I love the Descendants. I love them then. I still love them, and they still put out awesome records. What we, a great band. We had the pleasure of talking to. Uh, Three fourths of the current lineup. Yeah, it, we had only been doing the podcast for like a, a few months. Granted, we still have only been doing it for a few months, <laughs> but it was like it was like two or three months. Uh, yeah, two or three months in. <laughs> and you, guys I, have, you guys have the best gimmick in the world. I'm gonna tell everybody about you guys. I just did this podcast <laughs> with these little kids. These little punk rock kids is so cool. Let me tell you, if you wanna, if you wanna interview 
any one of my friends' bands, Sick of It All or Agnostic Front or any kind of like straight edge bands, you let me know and I'll make it happen because you guys are awesome. You remind me of my kids. Thank so you. Cool. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. But all right. Well, what do you guys? I'm asking you guys all these questions. You don't want to <laughs> ask me any questions? So, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so you've been you've been teaching yoga via Zoom. So how did you first get into yoga? Well, you know, it's funny because before I got into physical yoga, I actually got into yoga philosophy. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that band Shelter that I was in, hmm. but the whole vibe of Shelter was, uh, you know, me and the singer were in this like band called Youth of Today, which was a straight edge band. And uh, lo and behold, like the band got wildly popular. It was so crazy because here I was, I was out of high school. I'm 18. I'm like still a teenager. And all of a sudden I'm in this band Youth of Today, you know, where we went practicing in, literally not even in my garage. We would practice in like my <laughs> TV room at my dad's house. <laughs> And the next thing you know, we're going all over the world playing these like super big shows. We're going to Europe. You know, for me, that was like a dream. I was just a kid. And, uh, you know, so that was always a dream from the time that I was like your age. I always wanted to be in a band. I wanted to play music. I wanted to be able to, you know, um, you know, do it for a living. And next thing I know, I'm barely out of high school and I'm playing all over the world, like some really big shows. So, you know, I think when, you know, I think when you're a musician, you have this idea of once I get it, once I get a little fame and once my band gets popular, once I start selling a bunch of records, then I'm going to be happy, right? Then I'm going to be happy. But, you know, life doesn't really work like that. And I understood at a young age that things like money, fame, popularity, Instagram followers, um, power, prestige like all those things that people kind of all those materialistic things that people want if you get them if you're lucky enough to get them you'll understand that they actually don't bring you a deep sense of happiness and satisfaction and so i understood that like i was like a 19 year old kid and i was like i don't get it i've gotten everything that i wanted out of life and i still don't feel like in my heart that i'm really have this deep sense of fulfillment or happiness and it, it sent me on a spiritual search. Like there's got to be something more to life. There's got to be something more to life than just being pat on the back by a bunch of kids who like your band and getting all this external validation. And I can imagine it's even worse these days with like social media and like yeah. trying to up your followers and like, like sure. All- if, like sure. A new Instagram follower is cool, but then the next day you're over it. Like, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's all ex, it's all external validation. It, it really doesn't hit home to your heart. And and I, I understood that enough to be like, you know what, let me materialism isn't working for me. Let me try something spiritual. So at a very young age, I started, you know, investigating all different things like Buddhism and Taoism and reading like I was like a voracious reader, like I would read any kind of book on wisdom or knowledge or truth that I could get my hands on. So I was reading from all these different traditions. And then, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that really kind of resonated with me or really kind of, you know, you know, struck a chord with me was, you know, Eastern spirituality from India. And I would read books like the Bhagavad Gita. And I was just like fascinated by the Bhagavad Gita. Like, wow, I've really got to learn and understand this book. So when I was in my early 20s, I started going to India and I was studying yoga, but I wasn't really studying physical yoga yet. I was into like the spiritual side of yoga, the meditational side of yoga. So I would go to India and I would learn things like meditation and chanting and kirtan and like the power, how sound affects your consciousness. And I was studying Bhagavad Gita from like these masters in India at different ashrams. And then I came back to America and I moved into ashrams and, and the singer for you today was also into all this stuff. So we did this band called shelter and shelter was a hardcore punk band that we actually got, you know, pretty big out of all the bands that I did shelter got really big. I mean, 
we toured or we did like arena tours with no doubt when no doubt was like the hugest band <laughs> in the world back in the nineties. <laughs> and, you know, I met Gwen Stefani and, you know, she was super cool. And, um, we tried to do the band where we tried to put out a message that was like anti-materialism because we had experienced all these kind of spiritual truths that were really fascinating us and, and kind of shaping who, who we were becoming as like young adults. And so that's how I really like got into how I got into like becoming a yoga teacher because, you know, these days there's a lot of yoga teachers, but nobody, it's very few and far between people that really understand yoga as a lifestyle and as a culture and as a spiritual path. And that was something that I had studied for years. And so it was just kind of like a natural thing that where I became a yoga teacher. You want to, you want to hear the story how I became a yoga teacher? Yeah. yeah go ahead. <laughs> this is going to be so important to you when you guys graduate high school. Okay. Listen closely to what I have to say and have all of your friends listen to this too. Cause you're all kids that need to hear this. Okay. So. When, she, when Shelter ended, I, I, shel I quit Shelter probably at the height of our popularity because I got married and my wife got pregnant. And so I couldn't, Shelter used to tour year round, year round. We would just get in the van and we wouldn't stop. And we would go all around the world. We'd go to Japan, we'd go to South America, we'd go to Europe, we'd go back to Europe. We'd tour all of America, we'd go to Canada. Like it was just like that, it was just like nonstop. I've played everywhere. You name the place. <laughs> name a place. Uh, Baltimore. I've played Baltimore so many times I can't even count. <laughs> yeah, next, next time you're in Baltimore, we're going to. Baltimore's not like exotic place. I thought you were going to say. I like, know. I, it's, All right. It's um, where we are. I thought you were going to say Singapore. Or <laughs> Russia. I was going to say Australia or Russia. So. I, I, <laughs> I played incredible shows in Russia. Oh my God. It was so weird. When we went to Russia, when I was in this band, Youth of Today, we had this kind of look that they called the youth crew look. Have you guys ever heard of youth crew? Yeah. Well, we had Youth of Today, we didn't dress punk rock. We kind of dressed like jocks because we kind of were jocks, but we were into punk. So I used to wear like a varsity jacket and, you know, we would have like, we would wear Vans before anyone knew who Vans were. You know how Vans are super popular these days? Yeah. I would wear Vans to school and kids would make fun of me mercilessly. Now, if, mercilessly. You, now, now if you don't wear Vans, you get me fun of. That yeah. Is, that blows my mind. That blows my mind. I used to wear like high top Vans. People would be like, what kind of shoes are those, you loser? Those aren't Nikes. What kind of loser are you? <laughs> yeah, but no, anyway. now it's like like Adidas, Nike, and Vans. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we so we had this kind of we had this kind of like look that was sort of a clean cut look, but we were punk rock. And so it was funny because we went to Russia and we played in Moscow. And there was about a thousand kids came to the show and they were all dressed like I dressed when I was 18 in youth of today, like back in the day, like they all had like varsity jackets on that said like <laughs> Moscow straight edge on the back of it. They all had X's on their hands. They were dressed really clean cut and they had the vans and they had their jeans with the jeans rolled up. <laughs> they literally looked exactly like I looked when I was 18. And I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> You hear a bunch of like youth group people in Russia. And it's funny because they couldn't even speak English that well, but they could sing along with every single song. And it was just mind blowing that you know, here I am like a middle-aged guy playing Russia in my band that I started when I was 18. And everybody knows all the words, all these songs that we wrote like decades ago. So that was really cool. But I digress. Let me give you, <laughs> let me tell you this story about, how I became a yoga teacher because this is so important for you guys to hear, man. You have to hear this and you have to think deeply about this. And I tell you when you're 18 and you're about to like go off into the world on your own, you're going to remember this story and it's going to have a huge impact on you. You guys ready for this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I quit shelter. I quit punk rock. I'm married. 
my son is on the way to be born. And then I was like, okay, well, now I have to get a real job because my, the only thing on my resume that I did from the time I was 18 was Bands. travel in my <laughs> hardcore band, which nobody is going to give you a job. <laughs> <laughs> So I went back to school and I learned graphic design because I was always like, I was always the guy that was like doing the flyers and making the flyers and designing the record covers. So I was interested and I figured here's something creative that I could do, but I could make a living at it. So I went back to school for graphic design and then I became a graphic design teacher and I taught at this like computer school. And it was really cool. It was actually kind of cool and fun. And I didn't mind doing it because I would teach Photoshop and Illustrator and all these kind of you know programs. Uh, but then we got a new boss. A new boss bought the company. And this guy was such a freaking jerk. He was such a jerk. He was such a materialistic freaking douchebag. <laughs> and all he cared about was money. All he cared about was freaking money. And so he had, he started having me teach these classes. Like, I don't know if you guys even know these things like Excel and Microsoft Word. Yeah. You guys use this stuff in school. We use those like every day. Yeah. I don't uh, eat Excel, but it's, it's necessary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, and I'm like a musician. Like I hate Excel. Like I hate Microsoft Word. Like I hate Microsoft Outlook. Like I hate, PowerPoint and all this like stuff. And so he, he, he started making me teach these classes and I didn't even know them. Like I literally, I never used them before in my life. And so he handed me a manual. I have to learn all these classes and I hated teaching those classes. I freaking hated it. I hated teaching Excel. <laughs> I hated math when I was a kid, you know? So like I'm teaching this math formula program. It was misery to me. I had to get up for eight hours to talk about Excel. I'd rather freaking beat myself in the head with a freaking club. <laughs> and so finally one day, and so I was pretty miserable at this job. And so finally one day he came to me and he said, Hey, this other teacher's sick. You have to teach this class that's called project. Have you guys ever heard of project? It's project management software. Like if you're going to freaking build a condominium, you use this, <laughs> You use this software that's called Project where you kind of like map out all the different steps and skills that it's going to take and all the people and things that you have to come in and how to budget everything. And I was like, and he said, you have to teach this class tomorrow. I said, that's an impossibility. I've never used Project in my life. I've never been a project manager in my life. It's impossible. And he said, not only that, it's a level two class. So here's the manual that's this thick for level one. And here's the manual that's this thick for level two. And you have to teach the level two class tonight. So you better, you better go home and start studying. And I said, I don't want to do that. And he said, you either do it or you're freaking fired. What do you think of that? And he like screamed in my face. This guy was such a jerk. And so I said, I didn't want to get fired. So I said, Shh, crap, damn, I'm going to have to go home and I'm going to have to learn this project management software that I have absolutely no interest in. So I went home and you can imagine I'm doing all the, first I have to learn the program. So I'm studying the level one book, which is so boring. You ever have that class in school that's so boring that you can't stand? Like what class is like that for you? Neither of us really like math. So. Yeah. yeah, math sucks. I, I mean, like, complain about math. Like, I, you know, like, we both get good grades, and like, I'm in like a, it's in like an, it's like a advanced class, but like, I don't know why I am. Like, I do good, but I have absolutely no interest. And trying to learn geometry online is the most annoying thing because it's yeah. horrible. It doesn't make sense. And like, you, okay, so some of the software makes you you can't just like write the equations in you have to type every single thing out so like every parenthesis every little dash it's very annoying my math <laughs> teacher is is just such a jackass <laughs> she um like you want to you want to know why you guys hate math because you're creative like me and creative people are like right-brained people and math people are like left-brained people and we're just not like them we're just not wired for math and the but, funny part is I was talking to my friend who's in the same class as me, 
and we, you know we're both in geometry this year and she's like you know it's really funny how every single year they've given you those word problems and prompts except for geometry because they know you're not, not going to use geometry unless you're a scientist <laughs> or you teach geometry <laughs> And it's yeah, like, it's it's like why point. do they why do they force you to learn these things? You'll never yeah, like, use it. I, I, I take I take algebra and um I got like a bad grade on something and I, you get two attempts uh when it's not like a major grade. So I went to do the second attempt, but it would make sense for it to at least view you or at least let you view what you got wrong. Yeah, like not tell you what the right answer was, but tell you what you got wrong. Because in person, yeah, they write on the paper. They're like, yeah, you got this one wrong. If you want to redo it, you have to fix this. So it's like, yeah. So then you how am I supposed study to know what you what got wrong? Do? Yeah. How do I know what to do if I don't know what I got wrong? Let me yeah, tell you. So pu- I, I, I public said, high school is ridiculous. Public we're in middle school. Pretty- yeah, this is middle school. Wow. So I, I sent her like an email. I was like, can I redo this? I sent it like Sunday night, just got an email back today. I was like, can I redo this? Cause I didn't get a good grade and I can't see what I got wrong. She was like, oh, I closed it. She's like, I closed it. So now you can't make a second attempt. That sucks. Yeah. yeah. You, and let me tell you something. You want to know why you guys hate math because you're not math types. You're creative types. You're musicians. You do a podcast. You're people, people. You know, it's just like a, it's a whole different and nothing against math. Some people are great at math. They have a mind for math. They're like math. You guys probably know some of your friends are just like math geniuses. They can wrap their head around geometry like it's nothing. <laughs> That's yeah. because they just have a different they just have a different mindset. You want to know what Einstein said? He said, you shouldn't shame a fish because he can't ride a bicycle too well. Meaning that just because you can't do math and you get bad grades in math, don't feel bad about yourself because you want to know something. You're just have you're just firing on different cylinders in your brain, and you can write music, and you can be creative. And you can you're probably like interested in art, and you and you like talking to people, and you like you know doing creative things. It's just a different it's just a different way that you that you're hardwired. So you shouldn't feel bad about not liking math. I find it ridiculous that they even make kids learn freaking math. Because if a person's a musician, he doesn't want to learn freaking math. Like, he want to okay. learn music. Like when, when, like, there, when there's word problems, I, I get it. Like when it gives you a, like a real world scenario, I get it. I don't have a problem with that. But when it's just like graph the slope of this equation, I'm not going to go to like the 7-Eleven. They're not going to knock my phone out of my hand and go, have to use this. Yeah, you want to know what's funny? You'll never use it. You'll never use it. Yeah. (laughs) I'm like, I'm in like the advanced classes. Like I get straight A's, but it's like some kids can do that so easily. And I'm just like, man, I'm sitting here working and very stressed. And there's other kids that are like, yep, another 100. And I'm like, dude, I get A's, but it's not easy. Like it takes me time. You know, like I'm not the type of person that could just go in, take a math test and be fine. Because it also gets to the point that it's not just the content anymore. It's also just my brain because I'll go into a test that I know everything on and do horribly because I get super anxious and second guess all of my answers. Yeah. (laughs) You know what? Don't worry about it because everything that you're going to learn in all of your junior high and high school years, you will not remember one year out of high school (laughs) (laughs) and you will barely use any, like, I, I seriously think that they have to like really rethink school. And they have to see kids as not like the lowest common denominator and have to recognize that all kids are different and they should be schooled different. And when kids find something that they like to do, they'll excel at it. But to just force kids to like do math or do like chemistry or something that they just are so bored in and have absolutely no aptitude or interest for, it's like torturing them. It's like it's, it's a bad system of, of schooling that we have in this country. But I digress. Let me get let me get to this other story about <laughs> that's going to become valuable to you when you graduate. Okay, so check it out. Let me actually let me turn on my light for a second. It's starting to get dark early. Okay, so back to I'm at the computer school. 
and the guy gives me this project software and I have to teach the class. There's actually a lot of math that's involved in this project software too, which I freaking hate. I freaking hate. So I am, I was literally up all night long studying these super boring manuals for this super boring freaking project software. And then I have to walk into a class and give a level two, teach a level two class to a bunch of people who are actually project managers. That's their <laughs> freaking job, okay? I've never managed a project in my life and I have to teach them software that I barely know that I tried to cram into my head the night before. It's freaking ridiculous. Can you imagine how stressful that day was for me? I had to BS a room full of people for eight hours that I actually knew this much about project management. And it was like thinking on my feet the whole time. I was sweating, sweat was like pouring down my face. And so I, ma I made it through this class. And then I walked into the, um, the owner's office, the guy that made me did the class. And I had those two manuals, those really thick ones. And I freaking threw them down on his desk. And I said, don't ever do that to me again. Don't ever do that to me again. Do you know how stressful that was? I didn't sleep last night. I was studying these stupid manuals. And then I had, to, I had to cheat those people. I was like, those people paid good money to be taught by a person who actually you know, is proficient in the software. And you just cheated all those people by sending me in there practically blind to BS my way through a class all day. I was like, what kind of freaking owner are you? And you want to know what he said to me? You want to know what he said to me? You want to know what he said to me? <laughs> he said, hey, guess what? Not one person asked for their money back. And that's all I care about. You. That's all I care about. And he said, business is about making money. And he said, anybody that tells you anything different is lying to your face. All I'm interested in is making money. And as a matter of fact, he goes, I don't care if you were qualified or if you were unqualified to teach that class. You made it through that class and no one asked for their money back. So I don't care. I don't care if people learned anything. I don't care if people had a good experience. I don't care if you were stressed out and you had to stay up all night. All I care about is that I got the money for that class and it's in the bank. And as a matter of fact, you're just like a commodity to me. And if I could figure out a way that I could pay you less and have you actually show up for the job, I would do it because it's all about bottom line and that's business and that's what it's all about. And if anybody else tells you anything different, they're lying to you. So wrap your head around that. That's how we're gonna do things around here. And you wanna know what I said to him? I said, you're so fucked up. I fucking quit your shitty job, fuck you. And wow. I walked out of there. Check it out. Now, at this point, my son is born. My wife doesn't work. She's a stay-at-home mom. And I just quit my job with no plan B. <laughs> <laughs> and I went home. And I told my wife that I quit that job. And of course, she's super upset with me. I have a house. I have to pay the mortgage. And you know, that night, I just thought to myself, and like, this is, the, this is the lesson, kids. Listen up. This is the lesson. I thought to myself, this is actually an opportunity because I was miserable at that job. And even though I made decent money, I was freaking miserable and unhappy. And every day that alarm went off on my phone and I had to wake up and take a shower and go to work, I was dreading going to work. And the whole time I was at work, I was thinking, I was watching the clock thinking, when can I leave this freaking building? Cause I can't stand it. Never do that. <laughs> I don't care how much money you make. I don't care if you make a million dollars a year, <laughs> never do that. It's a waste of freaking life. It yeah. really is to work a job that you don't want to be there that you have no enthusiasm for. It doesn't matter if you make, a million dollars a year, don't do it. It will kill your soul. And so I was at this predicament where I was like, okay, well now um, I'm going to have to come up with something else. And you know, want to know what I thought to myself? I said, I'm never going to work one of those jobs again 
where I have to watch the clock and be miserable the whole time. I'm just not going to do that. I'm not going to spend the next X amount of decades of my life being miserable in a job. It's just not worth it. So you want to know what I started to think? I started to think, what do I like doing? What do I like doing? And the one thing that instantly came up for me was, I like doing yoga. And then I said, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to become a yoga teacher. And my wife was against it. And everyone thought I was crazy. And everybody tried to talk me out of it and go freaking do some job that you hate again and just for a paycheck. And I was just like, no, no, I know I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to crush my soul in a freaking little box every single day and sleepwalk my way through a freaking day looking at the clock so I can get home and just be so exhausted that I just sit in front of Netflix until the freaking next day when it all starts again. (laughs) I'm not going to live like that. And plus I had this idea in my head from all my spiritual studies that life isn't about money. Life isn't about what you can, what you can take. Life is about what you can give. So I started thinking in my mind, what can I do? What kind of job that I can do that I can do that a, I like to do and B will help people and will contribute something to a person's life. And I thought yoga, yoga will help people. I can use all my experiences of all the studies that I've done for years of going to India and studying at ashrams and living in ashrams. I was like, I'm going to become a yoga teacher and everybody I'm talking everybody, even my own wife was like, you shouldn't do that. You should just go back to the grind. And you know what I did? I went, you know, I already knew yoga. I was doing yoga every day. I went, I got my friend, Ray Capo, who was the singer for Shelter. He's actually, his name's Raghunath now. And he's like a pretty famous yoga teacher. He said, I'll let you take a teacher training for free just because you're my friend. And I said, awesome. So I took his teacher training for free. I started teaching the day that I graduated that teacher training. And then after six months, I opened up my own yoga studio. And let me tell you, it was the greatest decision I ever made. And now I'm a yoga teacher. That's what I do. I do some graphic design on the side of stuff that I like to do because I still like Photoshop and Illustrator and doing stuff like that. But I teach yoga. And you know what? It's so fulfilling for me. I keep people healthy. I contribute to their lives. You know, I, through, through all the um, meditation that we do, it makes people very peaceful and centered and balanced. And I really feel like my life has a purpose and I'm doing some good work in the world. And even though I could be out doing some business job where I'd be making twice the money, I don't care. I'd rather make half the money and do something that's of service to people in the world. And I tell you, every day I wake up, my alarm goes off. I wake up at five o'clock in the morning. I'm excited to wake up and teach yoga. I'm excited for it. It helps people. It's the, it's the way that I can serve and contribute into the world. And that makes all the difference. Never work one of those dead end jobs. <laughs> I don't care what your parents tell you. I don't care what your freaking stupid guidance counselor tells you in high school. <laughs> don't do it. Remember what this crazy punk rock guy said to you when you were 13. <laughs> Find something that you like to do and find something that will help other people. And that's the magic combination to a happy life. Drop the mic. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Any other questions? Uh, Thank you so much. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, thank you. I think that was a good note to end on. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm super inspired by you kids, man. You kids are the best. You're, you're so creative and doing such awesome stuff at age 13. I'm like inspired by you guys. You guys keep up this attitude of like wanting to like put out good things in this world and like, you know, talking with creative people and inspiring people. You'll become an inspiring person yourself, man. I'm, I guarantee you, you're on the right path. Keep going. Keep wearing that Meyer Threat hat. <laughs> oh, I wear it in every every interview for some reason. Like even over the summer. Yep. All right, <laughs> stay stay straight. At, are you guys vegetarian? No. All right, guys. <laughs> I know you're. I know you're 13, and know your parents probably aren't vegetarian, and they feed you, so it's really hard. But one day, one day soon, you'll be out of the house. And may these words 
echo in your mind. I have to go vegetarian. You guys care about the world, right? You guys understand that we have global warming and climate change and all these terrible things are happening to the world. Do you guys know that, that the meat industry is, is the biggest polluter and the biggest cause of climate change in the world? Let that sink in. Let that sink in. You're the generation that's going to change things. I am positive of it. It's just from like my own kids and their friends. You guys are so freaking woke and switched on. It's, it's unreal. And we just were like, and because of the internet, you guys think so globally. It's just like amazing. You guys are the guys that are going to fix the world and change the world. And one thing that you guys have to fix is this meat centered diet is killing the world. You guys care about the rainforest, right? Yeah. You guys, you guys want to see the rainforest be a rainforest when you grow up because you understand the rainforest is like the lungs of the planet and it's providing the oxygen for the whole entire planet, right? Yeah. Do you know who's you know who destroys the rainforest? McDonald's, Burger King, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Wendy's. They go down there and they clear cut the rainforest because it's such cheap land. And then they graze cattle for cheap hamburgers on that land. It's fast food burger companies that are deforesting probably the most important life-giving part of the planet. Don't stand for it, man. You guys are the new generation that's freaking woke. You have all <laughs> these freaking old, freaking capitalistic, materialistic people that are ruining your planet just so they can get rich <laughs> don't stand for it man don't stand for it make changes probably the biggest change that you can make is you go you go on a plant-based diet so much climate change is caused from the meat industry so much water pollution is caused from the meat industry it's literally strangling the planet the biggest thing that you can do to help mother earth heal and to help global warming is to eat a plant-based diet. Uh, I understand that you guys are, are kind of like, you just are, are fed, <laughs> so you really don't have much choice. But man, I am like praying to Krishna right now that somehow or other you remember those words when you're old enough to make your own decisions about what to eat, because it's important. And it's not only gonna affect your generation, it's gonna affect generations to come it's going to affect your kids so get freaking woke man the meat industry is freaking on punk trust me do a little research on it okay yeah all right, <laughs> all right man you kids are awesome i'm super <laughs> inspired you. by you guys um if you guys ever want me to get any of my friends bands you just let me know i'm gonna tell i'm gonna tell them they have to do your podcast <laughs> i'm gonna Dominic, I have your email address. I'm going to have all my freaking friends email you and, and, and volunteer for your podcast. This is going to be the biggest podcast in the world. You guys are only 13. It's freaking awesome. By the time you're 15, it's going to be the biggest podcast. Well, thank, you, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right, guys. My pleasure. All the best to you. All right. Stay safe. Stay safe. All right, take care.